Valentine's Day is coming, and so I, I got a head start on it here. I get a head start. Um, You've been real good. <laughs> you know, I realize there's not enough in this. I didn't get enough for all of you. Uh, and so I'm going to save it for my sweetheart. Um, so um, there's this song. I left my heart in San Francisco. Um, but for me... Um, Natalie took off to see her sisters on Thursday down in Medford, Oregon. And so I can sing, She took my heart to Medford, Oregon. (laughs) So she's on her way back this evening. And so for the first time in history, I got to jump on Valentine's Day. Usually it's that I'm one of those guys going in that day of looking for a flower and some chocolates and they're all gone and all that. So I got to jump on it. So guys, I'm just saying, okay, head start. Um, But the real reason for the heart is that this is what God wants between you and him. He wants this love relationship like none other because he's the one that gave you life eternal. And so, in the meantime, he wants our hearts to be, to be in tune with his heart. He wants that kind of friendship, that kind of relationship with us. He doesn't want your church. You know, we, we get this churchianity. Oh, I'm going to go to church today because that's, that's nice and all. But he doesn't want you just coming to church. He wants the relationship. He wants your heart. And so Jesus, when he was asked what was the most important of all commandments, he said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. And once that happens, then the second commandment is easier. And he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Evidence that you've connected with God is the way you love the people that are around you. He wants that heart connection. So that heart connection is an amazing thing because for some of us, it takes a lifetime trying to figure that out. How does that, how does that work? And maybe for some of you, uh, like me, it's like, I don't know, uh, you know, for a long time, is how do I love somebody with all of my heart, somebody I don't see, you know, I can't, um, but I'm hearing and I'm believing. Or even, you know, my wife, I think I told you when we were dating, she was... She was the one talking, and I was just listening, and she would tell me when we were dating, I love you, Steve, and I'd be going, I'd, be, I'd try to say it back, <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't know if it was to love somebody with all my heart to, to say that, you know, and so it, it took some work, but, you know, after we got married, I, didn't, I found out what true love was when two years after we were married, we came to know the Lord. And then I understood love. But before that, it was a a worldly thing that if you treat me nice, I'll treat you nice, that kind of, you know. So here we are today, and um, we're talking about people that have a, um, they've they've arrived at that place, Barnabas and Saul, they've committed their life to the Lord. And so that's a love relationship. They've committed their life to the Lord and they're willing to serve and even do special assignments. They were, the Holy Spirit um, led them to go on this assignment. And so we've been watching this assignment. You could say it's uh, Paul's first missionary trip, but this assignment, he ends up in in Antioch uh, teaching there when they found out that there was the first uh, non-Jewish church that was established in Antioch. And so uh, he was there and uh, Barnabas and they were teaching and then they were sent off to the island of Paphos. It was one of the places, an amazing thing happened. The proconsul believed after a false prophet was moved out of the way um, through the power of the Holy Spirit so that he could believe. And so he saw the power and he responded. And, and so uh, we're picking up in that story. I'm just doing a brief cap of where we've been in that story, and then um, um, we're headed into 
uh, the second part of their assignment. So we are in Acts chapter 13. And we're beginning at verse 13. And guess what? There's another place called Antioch. So there's, there's two of them. And so he leaves this one and he takes this trip and he ends up in this, in this uh, other place called Antioch. And here's, here's what happens. And, and it kind of recaps it in verse 13 uh, here. So it says in verse 13, when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Pergama in Pamphylia and John departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. And, you know, that's John Mark. They had kind of picked him up and they were training him. Um, verse 14. But when they departed from Pergamum, they came to Antioch in Poseidon and went into the synagogue. And on the Sabbath day, they sat down. And after the reading of, we're in verse 15, after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. So here they are. They listened to the word. They went into the, the synagogue, and they're listening. And so um, so what happens next is, a, is an amazing moment in teaching for Paul. So you know Paul is Pharisee of Pharisees. He's been educated under the best, and uh, he came to Christ, and now he's teaching that uh, Jesus is the Messiah, he is the Christ, he's the answer to life. And so um, here's Paul. And I want you to notice he gives this history lesson when he begins to uh, speak to the group that asked them to speak. And you know, that's, that's an amazing thing if uh, you're with your family and friends maybe around the holidays and they ask you to pray over the meal. They know you're spiritual or something like that and they said, hey, could you just... That's an amazing privilege that they recognize something and they ask you to pray. Maybe somebody's come to you that's a non-believer and they said, would you pray for me? What an amazing thing to be that person that somehow they figured out you have a relationship with God and your prayers make a difference and you can pray over them. What, a, what an amazing thing. Maybe it's when you simply ask somebody when they share tough times and you say, uh, I wonder if I could pray for you. And they say, I, I would love that. What, what an amazing privilege that you and I have been given. And so we find Paul and Barnabas in a place of being amazing place where either their reputation went before them or somehow, but, but they noticed that they were visitors and they asked, if you have something to say, would you share that with us? Okay, so here's Paul and he does this um, honoring of the people that are there. Um, he speaks to him in verse 16. So his kind of introduction, he, he, uh, he honors the people that are there saying, I recognize you. So he says, it says in verse 16, Paul stood up motioning with his hands and look at what he says. He says, men of Israel. So that would have been the Hebrew people that were in the synagogue. So he says, Men of Israel. So that got their attention that he's addressing them. And then he says, and you who fear God, listen. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? You who uh, obey God, you who uh, understand his power, you who love God, uh, that could be all wrapped up in you who fear God. The beginning of, of wisdom is to fear the Lord, the one who has all the power, right? So, so there was a different group of people there. There would have been Jew, uh, Gentile people there, those who feared God, those who were seeking after God. So I love that when he, he began that way and he, he stated who was in the audience there. And then he begins this history lesson. And he goes back You'll notice he goes back to their deliverance from Egypt. And in his history lesson, he comes up to David and stops right there. So he goes back to history and he comes up, stops right there. And he takes that moment and he jumps right there and speaks about the Messiah. So he doesn't go all the way back to Genesis. He doesn't go all the way back to uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he goes back to their deliverance. 
So follow with me. I'll, I'll read that through. So watch what happens then. Verse 17. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. So just in that brief sentence, they knew that whole story about all that power that was on display and how they brought him out and how the, the, the sea was divided and how they came through and Pharaoh's home. So that statement right there, just they knew what he was talking about. And so he, all he had to do is make that statement. I, th- I think that's beautiful. Verse 18, now for a time of about 40 years, <laughs> it's, he says next, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. <laughs> okay, put up with their ways in the wilderness. Verse 19, and when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. Now, right here in verse 19, it's after Moses died and Joshua takes over and they take the land. So the Hebrew people would have known exactly what he's talking about. So he's just making these statements, bringing them through history. And then he's moving on to David. Watch this. Verse 20. After that, he gave them judges for about 400 years, 450 years, until Samuel the prophet. Verse 21. And afterward, they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. Verse 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. All right. So here's his history lesson. He went back, he brought it forward briefly, and he ends up talking about David. And why David? Because David was the top of the heap for Israel. He, it was when Israel ruled the known world. David was the top. Okay? So he came back and he came through here and he said, then David. Okay. So... But he makes this statement about David. He said, he's a man after my heart. I found David a man after my heart. Isn't that amazing? Saul didn't quite have it. They would have known the story of King Saul, that he disobeyed, and so that leadership was taken from him. So what about David? Let's, let's look into a little bit about David, who he is. So in your Bibles, go to 1 Samuel. So back in the Old Testament, and uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, Joshua, Judges, uh, Ruth, 1 Samuel. Oh, there it is, 1 Samuel. So right back in there. So if you look at my Bible, that's about where it is in the Old Testament, right about there. So um, let's go to uh, 13, 1 Samuel chapter 13. And uh, this is when uh, Samuel is uh, confronting Saul. Uh, Verse 13, chapter 13, verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept the Lord, the commandment of the Lord. So stopping there, uh, let's go forward um, to um, chapter 16. So Samuel is looking for um, David. He didn't know where he was, who, who he was, but he knew he was one of Jesse's sons. So in chapter 16, Samuel, this is when he anoints David. Um, so let's pick up at verse 7. 
chapter 16, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For the Lord looks not at the outward, or the man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And then it goes on to say how all of his brothers passed before him. And then he calls out and he says, is there one more? And then David comes in from the field and the Lord says, this is the one. Verse 13 Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose and went to Ramah. Let's go forward in chapter 17. And this is the battle. David is sent by his dad, Jesse, to the battlefield with a lunch for them, and Things must have been a lot different back then when they did battles, right? So verse 26, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Jump over to verse 33. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took the lamb out of the flock, verse 35, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose up against me, I caught it by its beard and I struck and killed it. What? Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. I want to pause here for a moment. And I want to say in your life, there's been some powerful things that God has done. And when you look back, you're amazed at those things. And then all of a sudden, new things come and you get scared. But it's looking back on what God has done through you in the past that you might draw from that power, that experience of who he is in the future. I'm going to pick up at verse 38. So Saul clothed David with his armor and put on a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Verse 40, and when he took his staff, then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag and in a pouch in which he had. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come out with, to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcass 
the carcass of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth and all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. Then all the assembly shall know that the God does not save with sword or spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into my hands. And so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. When David put his hand in the bag and took out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel of Judah rose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Sharam, even as far as Gath and Ekron. What just happened? (laughs) God's power through a little shepherd boy. God's power turned that events that day. We've been talking over over weeks now that we're not on a playground anymore like kids. We're in a war zone. And serious serious times call for serious measures. And the most powerful thing we can do is get closer and closer to the one that created everything. And find out how he wants us to live through these times. And if you haven't figured it out yet, if you believe in the Lord Jesus, he's given you work to do in his kingdom. There's people that need to be saved. That's what it's about. He's privileged you and given you the responsibility of people around you to help them to find eternal life through Jesus Christ, to find that, to find true life. And through his spirit, he will give you the power and the insight to do that. But then it's your It's your responsibility to step toward the Lord so you can know his instruction and just how to go about and to give you the power to do that. So here's David. David served his time. David did his assignment. David turned the course of time right there on that battlefield. This David. So my question then is, why? Why was David a man after God's heart? How did that, how did that even come about? He was a shepherd boy out there, and God chose him, and but God chose him. He was, he was a man after his heart. So let's go back a little bit further into David's, um, David's life. And how is it? Well, um, keep your finger, if you haven't already, in the book of Psalms. But go back to where we are in our uh, reading today in, uh, in chapter uh, 13 of Acts. And I want to read this part again, verse 22. Why was David a man after God's heart? In verse 22 of Acts chapter 13, it says this. Um, And when he had removed him and raised up for them David as king, to whom he also gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, and this is what it says, who will do all my will. That's the key. So then I began wondering, Steve, am I a man after God's heart? Am I willing to do... um, his will, because I think that identifies a man or woman or boy or girl after God's heart. Am I willing to do what he's asking? Well, um, go to Psalm 23. There's this relationship as a shepherd boy where David was writing these songs out there tending to the sheep and apparently part of the time he was chasing down bear and lion 
David. But Psalm 23 comes out of this, a man after God's heart. This is his heart. This is his relationship with God. And David pens this song to God. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, isn't that a man that is after God's heart and he understands that God is going to take care of him? There's a relationship there. God is going to take care of him. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Do you know what that's like? Do you know what it's like to be restored? Some of you have been through some really hard things and you've found that you've been restored in the Lord. You've found there's life after your spouse dies. That, that kind of pain I don't think will ever go away, but you, you've found restoration in, in God. You've, you've found that there's a, a deeper relationship with God that he's calling you to that. He said, he restores my soul and then he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's our, our assignments. They're bigger than what we can do and sometimes it's pretty dangerous. But he says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Isn't that a beautiful place to be? Is that you're not afraid of anything. Wow. He's not giving you a spirit of fear when you've believed in him. He's giving you his Holy Spirit, the, the spirit, the power that created everything. What do you have to be afraid of, right? We have to remind ourselves about that. There's no fear. There's no fear. Isn't that a beautiful place to be? Some of you... I've gotten old enough and you, I've heard this, you know, I don't care anymore what people think. <laughs> if I want to talk about Jesus, I'll talk about Jesus. I used to be afraid that they wouldn't like me. I don't care anymore. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you're arrived at that place where, you know, I'm going to speak the truth in love, of course, but you're not fearful that somebody's not going to be your friend anymore because you found your friendship in God, Right? but you still love people. So he says, so much so, he says, your rod and your staff, will they comfort me? Verse five, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. It's like, well, I'm gonna just sit down and have a meal with Jesus. You know, <laughs> presence. You've anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. So that, that wake behind you is goodness and mercy. You know, it's, it's the spirit of God. I want to show you something else in the next chapter, chapter 24. And what I'm sharing with you is David's heart, his heart between God. And so we've been reading this beautiful uh, song that we quote at funerals. We quote whenever we can, we read. But look at Psalm 24. Here's David's understanding about who God is again and their relationship. He says, the earth is the Lord's and, and all that there is, or all of its fullness, and the world and those who dwell within. He has founded upon the seas and established it upon, establishes upon the waters. And then he asks this question. Who can get close to God? He says, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He's talking about a relationship with God Almighty. And he says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Can I just insert Jesus Christ right there? Right there. The only way you can have clean hands and a pure heart is if God takes away your sin. And the only way that happens is by believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that he came, he died on the cross for the sin, your sins, the sins of the world. 
And then he came back to life to prove his power over sin and death. That's how you have, have clean hands and a pure heart. That's the only way. So if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can ascend into the hill of the Lord. You can draw close to this holy God, this God that created all things. And he wants you to. And the New Testament says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. I think for most of us, God is there. He's waiting for you to, to step towards him for you to experience this kind of love Amen. instead of you sitting there going, where's God? Why doesn't he talk to me? He's waiting for you to get serious about this relationship because it changes everything. It changed what this noggin thinks during the day. Your closeness with God changes the way you look at people, the way you talk to people, the way you see the world and what's going on. When the Holy Spirit takes close, when you take a step closer, you begin to be renewed more and more in the spirit of your mind, and it goes into your heart. The way a person thinks is what they are. If you have a good governor, you can think about crazy things, and you can come to church and, and look like everything's together. But if you know the Lord, you don't have to play that game. You can know, he says, if you confess your sins, I'm faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness that you come to him and he cleans you up any minute of the day when you recognize that relationship. So he says, who may ascend in the hill, Lord? So in verse five, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God who saved him, the God of his salvation. He said, this is Jacob. The generation of those who seek him, who seek his face. Now we're getting closer and closer, not only to the heart of David and God, we're beginning to see that that's possible for you and to me, for me every single day to draw closer and closer to God. And then verse seven, he gives credit to God and he said, lift up your heads, O gates, let, let them be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Or the Lord mighty and mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, let them be lifted up, O ancient doors. Who is this king of glory? And he says, the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. He's saying he's the almighty, that God is the almighty and he can do anything. That's who is coming into to your heart. God almighty that has the power to change anything in your life. So these are showing David's relationship with God. This man after God's heart is showing David's relationship with God. And it's opening up for you and for me too this relationship with God. So um, how does this happen? Um, he's willing to do God's will. David's willing to do God's will. <clears throat> In uh, Psalm 19, David records how much he loves God's commandments. It's like David's waiting there going, just tell me what to do. <laughs> I love God's commandments. Psalm 19 so not too far from where you are, Psalm 19, beginning at verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and they are righteous altogether. They, here's David's heart. They're more desirable. So, so wanting to please God, they're more desirable than gold and much fine gold. So all the money in the world, they're uh, sweeter than honey and the sweetest of the honeycomb. And then he says in verse 11, moreover by them, your servant is warned in keeping them. There's great reward. Isn't that a beautiful thing? In keeping his way of life there's, there's reward. 
And then he says, who can understand his errors or cleanse me from hidden faults? Or keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. And now we're beginning to see David struggle with his sin nature. And he says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength, my rock, my redeemer. Amen. So we get to see into David's life. God used him in a powerful way against Goliath and the, lion and the lion and the bear. And God used him in a powerful way. And yet David was learning some things about this relationship with God early on. And then it, it makes me think about the kids we just prayed for going out. Is that the precious time when God is going to meet their hearts so that they, when they get older, they can do these amazing things for God. Is it? But he's not finished with you and me yet. Yeah, we got work to do. You still have breath. You got work to do in the kingdom. So loving God's ways. So David learns how to worship in, in Psalm 100. He says, shout to the Lord all the earth. And he, he begins praising the Lord as you come into his presence. So he learned how to worship. And then in Psalm 51... After David sinned with Bathsheba, he has this heart of coming to God and calling out for forgiveness. And it's a beautiful song. So we're, we're just looking at David's life being called by God, but then being forgiven by God too. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only I have sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought up forth in iniquity in the sin of my mother she conceived me behold you desire truth in the inward parts in the hidden parts you have made me you make me and to know wisdom purge me with hyssop and i shall be cleansed wash me and i will be whiter than snow make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities verse 10 Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt and bloodshed, O God. God of my salvation, my tongue shall sing loud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, my mouth shall show forth your praise. For I do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good. In your good pleasure to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifice of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. They shall offer bowls on your altar. David, a man after God's heart. You and me. That's the question. Am I a man after God's heart? Are you a man or woman, boy or girl after God's heart? That's the relationship. That's why Christ died. That's why. In a, back to our passage, as we took a moment to jump from our passage of David's history lesson in chapter 13 of Acts, his history lesson and how he came up to David, and then from this point on, he talks about Jesus. From this point on. So verse 23, we're back in Acts 13. 
And from this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he, but behold, there, there is one that comes after me, the sandals of whose feet I am unworthy to loose. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, those among you who fear God, to you the word of salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, or even the voice of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Verse 29. Now, When they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and he was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled for us this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus it, as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I've begotten you. And he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he says, he also says in his other psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. But whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore, it let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is just justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And then he warns them, Beware, therefore, lest that what has been spoken to the prophets come upon you. Behold, the despisers marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. So Paul gave a history lesson and he went from the deliverance of Egypt to David and he went right from David and jumped over everything else and went to Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the promised one to come. And so today, in closing, Jesus said, remember me. Remember what I did for you to give you life and life abundant. That life abundant is a relationship with God himself through Jesus Christ. And he's given us his Holy Spirit to do that connection as we live this life here and now. And so what he's asking, again, is not just that you're going to heaven, but that you have a heart with God. That's the kind of, that's the kind of believer. And that's what David even said. This this is the, the people, the one who seek my face. This is the difference between just going to church and this is the difference between arguing about different things in the church. It's a heart after God because once that happens, everything up here changes and here changes. We've got work to do and the only way to do it is to be connected to, with God. So let's remember what Jesus did for us so that we could live this life of righteousness.